tonight we have the privilege, and I consider that privilege also because I had the privilege to uh, to call him, uh, as we said, as a friend, but of a extraordinary protagonist of the recent uh, uh, political uh, arena, in particular in the United Kingdom and the worldwide. Um, Sir David Roy leading to uh, KCB and CBE, British politician, member of the former member of the uh, UK Parliament, but also he served as a Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster and Minister of the Cabinet from the 2018-2019. As frequent uh, uh, in several occasions, I have been, uh, I've been, um, I've been appointed him as being seen how the people were calling him Theresa May, de facto Deputy Prime Minister. That was one of uh, the different title that uh, um, Sir uh, David has. Uh, collect during his uh, uh, career, his incredible career. Secretary of State for Justice, Lord High Chancellor of Great Britain, leader of the House of Commons and Lord President of the Council, Minister of State for Europe. So it's an incredible career. Tonight, uh, uh, Sir David, 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 for the friend, is going to address uh, an interesting speech talking about security challenger in a challenging world. Uh, I have to admit with you that I'm very uh, curious to listen what we're going to, to go through uh, today for a few reasons. First, because I, had a, I admire, I have, the for, I have unfortunately the fortune to meet David Olley at the end of, uh, of his path in, in his career. And uh, I missed the opportunity to, to have more opportunity to, to ask direct question to him. Tonight we have this opportunity. Uh, I remind that is the Chatham House uh, rule, and um, so everything is a confident, a confident uh, under the protection of the rules of the Chatham House. I would like also to remind that, as I said, I got the, this privilege to have the opportunity to meet uh, Sir David Livington. is a full of experience, of knowledge, is a life spoken. It's an evidence, it's an incredible career, and, uh, and again, I think that the only thing that we have now to do it is only to give him the opportunity to, to address directly to all of us. So, David, the floor is yours. Maurizio, thank you very much indeed uh, for the invitation and for your kind words of introduction. Um, I thought I'd, I'd offer a few reflections this evening by way of introduction on security challenges in, in a changing world. Um, by coincidence, uh, earlier today, uh, Ken McCall, the recently appointed director of the security service, uh, MI5, has given a speech on precisely this theme. Um, and actually, security matters have, to a very great extent, um, to been involved with quite a lot of my previous political career. Um, starting, I suppose, when I um, was a very young man, and before I was in Parliament, I, I had three years working for Douglas Hurd, Lord Hurd, when he was first of all Home Secretary under Margaret Thatcher, and then Foreign Secretary under Margaret Thatcher and John Major. Uh, and we were dealing then with the challenge from Russia and the Warsaw Pact, the, the, the Velvet Revolutions of 1989-90 and the unification of Germany, but at the same time with the in invasion of Kuwait by Saddam Hussein and at the Home Office with, a, a, with multiple security challenges from terrorism and organized crime. Later, when I was in the House of Commons, I was uh, PPS, it's the, the sort of parliamentary aide to uh, Michael Howard uh, uh, when he was Home Secretary, so got involved to some extent with domestic homeland security matters then. Then I had four years later on in opposition as the Shadow Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, going across there just as the IRA ceasefires had um, taken effect, but when the political process was still in its early stages. Uh, and, and then subsequently shadowed the Middle East and North Africa for a couple of years, then before doing Europe in government, and in the various roles I've had in, 
in government, um, uh, particularly most obviously in the cabinet, I, you know, I, I had a lot to do with security matters and uh, sat in my, my role as Minister of the Cabinet Office as, as uh, on the National Security Council that the Prime Minister Theresa May chaired. Um, after stepping down from the Commons, one of the things I've taken on is the chair of the Royal United Services Institute, RUSI, which, as many of you will know, is the oldest think tank in the world. We like to think of ourselves as one of the leading think tanks, um, certainly the, the key one in the United Kingdom on uh, security and defence policy. And one of the things that RUSI has done in recent years is to broaden the scope of its activities. It started off in the 19th century when the first Duke of Wellington uh, founded it, uh, very much as, a, a, as a, an organization focused upon military science on the armed forces. And that is still there and still important. But we also now have some first class research teams working on cyber security, on terrorist financing, on organized crime. Um, we are scoping out work on climate security and the implications of climate change on security matters. And we have seen, particularly since 2010, when the Cameron government took office, uh, the government machine also broadening its scope. And you talk to the intelligence chiefs, you talk to the uh, military commanders, the, the, the chiefs of staff, and they will be the first to say, there is now no neat dividing line between homeland security and international security. Um, the Salisbury chemical weapons attack was perhaps the most dramatic recent example of that. But speak to any chief constable, and they will tell you about how there's almost no serious organized crime in the United Kingdom now without some international dimension to it. We've seen the creation of a National Security Council with the National Security Advisor to the Prime Minister and a Secretariat to uh, support that work. Um, we're seeing the internet used and used increasingly by those who wish to do us harm as much as by those who use it for perfectly legitimate purposes. It is used as a means to groom and radicalize potential extremists and terrorists. It is used to organize the operations of serious and organized crime, including terrorism. It is a source of propaganda directed at political objectives. It is a, a vector for very widespread <coughs> fraud of individuals, families, households, and companies. And it is the means by which cyber attacks can be directed by our foes against uh, interests here, including against our critical national infrastructure. Indeed, one only has to think about the WannaCry attack upon uh, a number of interests a few years back, which caught the NHS uh, in, its, uh, in, in its assault, and which, which brought down the systems uh, by which a large number of hospitals in this country were managed for several days. Um, and that was an illustration of how rapidly and, and severely key public services and infrastructure can now be, uh, be, be harmed by uh, cyber attacks. If I look at the government's uh, integrated review of security policy published earlier this year, I thought it was a good a good, good piece of work. And I think that there are two things in particular I would single out. One is the clear identification of Russia as a continuing and very real threat. It's a military threat, yes, but Russia is under Putin is much more than that. We're seeing how Russia is trying to use a mixture of policies and tactics in Eastern Europe most obviously in Ukraine, but in Moldova, Belarus, and the South Caucasus as well, to try to pull those countries back into the orbit of the Kremlin. We're seeing Russia intervening to try to rig elections in Montenegro, in North Macedonia, 
dabbling in Bosnia-Herzegovina. We're also seeing um, Russian subversive tactics and Russian information propaganda warfare uh, used to try to influence elections in Western countries, even including the United States of America. I think so far the evidence is that in the long established Western democracies in Europe and North America, those efforts have been uh, unsuccessful. It's pretty difficult to subvert an election system that relies on people uh, going to a polling station and filling in uh, a ballot paper with a stubby bit of pencil. Uh, but the propaganda challenge is real. Um, and we've seen, particularly in the Donbass, uh, Putin rehearse a number of different tactics. He has used um, not just his command and control uh, facilities of his armed forces, he's used mercenaries and surrogates. He's used economic warfare, turning the gas flow on and off, uh, interrupting the export of agricultural produce from countries like Lithuania, Georgia, and Moldova, uh, when he thinks that they're getting a bit too uppity for the Kremlin's liking. We've certainly seen the use of Russian cultural influence through uh, the Orthodox Church, through uh, Russian language broadcasts uh, 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 and, and internet, an internet presence. So uh, that threat from Russia is real. But the big strategic challenge of the 21st century is going to be less from Russia than from China. In China now, under Xi, you have a government which champions its authoritarian approach to government and politics as an example that the rest of the world ought to follow. Uh, you have a country uh, that is seeking, I suppose in many respects, to re-establish itself as the dominant power that China has been for most of its history in its own region of the world, but nowadays in an interconnected world um, globally as well. And I thought what the Integrated Review uh, identified accurately was that the challenge from China now is not one of particular companies, Huawei or TikTok. China, frankly, doesn't care about the fate of individual companies. It is about a very open uh, Chinese determination to achieve uh, dominance in all the key 21st century technologies by the middle of the century. It is set out in a published document entitled uh, Made in China 2025, which lists all those technologies from synthetic biology to quantum computing to autonomous vehicles to zero carbon technology. Uh, and it's, it, it, it says that China wishes to establish by 2025 a leading uh, position in those technologies in global supply chains and by the centenary of the communist revolution in uh, 2049 a dominant position in all those technologies. And the risk for the West is not that we become dependent on Huawei or TikTok, but that we find that it is impossible by mid-century to uh, rely on any supplier being able to give what we need in, in, in technological terms without needing Chinese know-how, Chinese technology, Chinese kit. Uh, of some sort. Uh, and the lesson in my view for the democracies, both in America and in Europe, is that we have to get our act together and quickly in terms of renewing, rekindling our own capabilities to innovate, to experiment, to develop uh, te a technology base of our own and to adapt quickly because the pace of te technological change is so rapid. I get the impression that the Biden administration recognizes this, uh, but I think that there's going to be a really big challenge for uh, all the Western countries uh, as time goes on because 
post-COVID, there's a tendency to look to shorten supply chains, to look to support national champions and so on. Um, whether it's um, you know, British exceptionalism or America first or uh, European or EU strategic autonomy. Um, and yet actually uh, to meet the challenge from China will require the democratic world to find ways of working together, thrashing out common rules, common standards, um, so that uh, we don't actually trip each other up uh, in the, the race to uh, in, ensure that we have an alternative to dependence upon China by the middle of the 21st century. Other things I will just touch very briefly on, and then I will very much welcome questions and comments. One is, of course, I mentioned Russia and China. There are other threats too. Iran, North Korea still have um, active intelligence uh, services. Uh, organized terrorists are still a real threat to us. If you talk to the intelligence chiefs, particularly to MI5, they will say that every week they are uh, seeking to uh, disrupt uh, uh, specific uh, plots to uh, bring about terrorist violence in the United Kingdom. Um, Organised crime of all kinds operates internationally. And there is a very fuzzy line in practice between some of the organised criminal groups and uh, hostile states um, you know, the, the, who perhaps give license to, to people to operate uh, as uh, uh, criminal uh, actors um, and, and try, the government's trying to disclaim responsibility themselves, but they are actually hand in glove. Uh, and so I think that the, 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 the really big challenge for us looking forward is how do we respond in what the director of MI5 today talked about as the gray zone for which we've seen the rehearsal in Ukraine. We got used to the idea of a NATO collective response using Article 5 to a column of Russian tanks surging across uh, the plains of Central Europe into Germany. But what should our response be in NATO or in any other configuration of the democratic world to a cyber attack that might seek to bring down critical infrastructure? Um, what should our response be when we believe that uh, a, a criminal gang is, act, is in effect being sponsored by a hostile state? Um, and so I think those are important challenges. And for our own part, as well as meeting that technological challenge I spoke of a moment ago, we also need to do far more to improve our own resilience, to see critical national infrastructure as including uh, supply chains, networks, IT systems. It's no longer just a matter of the physical structures of a dam or a power plant, because as everyone knows, we are so dependent now upon uh, our IT systems, and, and uh, the people who manage those uh, to, to keep our key services and our key infrastructure going. So there is some really important work that is go I know is going on inside government, but I think nobody should underestimate the severity of the challenge that we currently face. And we have to see security as uh, a challenge which embraces the domestic and the international together, we cannot think of the, the, those anymore as separate silos. Maurizio, I will stop there, um, but very much welcome comments that, uh, and questions that anybody has, and let's see how the conversation goes. Thank you, David. So before I leave it to the time to uh, all our uh, the participants to formulate their own question, uh, I, as always, when I have a conversation with you, uh, I start with some certainty and then I come in with more questions. That is very good and indeed. Because you um, you mentioned a few a lot of things, very interesting. But so I have a three straight questions. The first one, you mentioned the Russian in, in Russian started to influence or try to influence the public opinion 
in a different country. The question that I have is, uh, do you think or you have evidence or you have any sense of that uh, Russian has already influenced, for example, event like Brexit and the Italian or, or, the, or any other election in the recent past? The second question that, uh, that is coming, according to what you said, um, in the 1989, the, the Berlin Wall lapsed because basically uh, the Western uh, society, the demo the, they, were, they have a system, democracy, capitalism, and innovation. So basically the Russian society, the communist society collapsed because they were behind uh, yeah. the innovation, they were behind the, uh, and th their structure of freedom, etc. Basically they were behind the innovation. So they were far behind of the innovation and they were in, uh, countries in bankruptcy. Now the new system, what you have just described is the, a Chinese mm -hmm. former communist country but for sure, a uh, 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 totalitarian country, let's say in this or different way than democracy, that embrace capitalism and want to, to compete on the, on, the, on the dominant position for innovation. And it looks like that they are in the, in the right position. So what is the hope for democracy on the future? Uh, does democracy as any um, does democracy bring any advantages or any uh, ad competitive advantages? You know, if we're talking about the competition as a product, is is democracy doesn't present any more co competitive advantages to win these challenges in innovation? And as you know, because we are the oldest democracy in the world, San Marino, founded in 301 after Christ. We, have, we are very key to consider that democracy has been always uh, an element that help, have helped the, um, the civilization to achieve what we have to, today. So without democracy, there is no really the modern civilization, but it looks like that there is any a contrast. So I leave it with you in the meantime that uh, Sir uh, David is going to prepare to answer my uh, question. <laughs> if any one of you has a question, please write on, on, the, on the chat or raise the hands and I will be more than pleased to, uh, to give you the opportunity to raise a question. Then there is also a question that has been written. So David, please. Marita, I, I, let, me, let me try to respond to those, those questions. I think, I think first of all, uh, the evidence of Russian interference. Um, I mean, obviously, quite a bit of this is um, that, that I, I know about because of the government offices I held with, when I had access to intelligence information, and I, I can't, you will understand, go into details about that. Um, but I certainly saw plenty there um, to, to satisfy me. Those efforts are real. Um, you, 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 you will get it on um, the one hand, I mean, I think in some of the Western Balkans elections, uh, the subversive attempts made by Russia were were uh, pretty easy to detect. There, it is it is also the case that there are a number of um, democratic countries in Europe where um, particular individuals are known to. Uh, to, 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 to be, be receiving considerable financial support from Russia or interests you know, very closely associated with the Kremlin. Um, the, what is, I think, much uh, more difficult to show is that there have been uh, successful attempts to interfere with the elections of long established democracies. Um, some of the Russian effort is overt. I mean, Russia today is the obvious example. What's striking about Russia today is that um, it is not a you know, monochrome, grey, uh, obvious, obvious propaganda channel. You know, it uses all the slick techniques of international uh, news channels. Um, to make it seem completely legit, even though it, the last thing it is is genuinely independent. There's a lot of other stuff that's covert. Um, 
it is a fact that there are very large numbers of uh, Russian bots that uh, take part in uh, controversies on Twitter, on Facebook and other social media platforms um, and efforts are made uh, by the relevant uh, authorities and agencies to get those taken down where that is possible. Um, I still think the, you know, I, 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 I think it almost certain, uh, certainly the, I mean, there was internet interference in the, the, the referendum campaign on Brexit, but I, you know, despite the fact that I was absolutely ardent Remain supporter, I saw no evidence that Russian that Russian effort was successful in the sense of swinging votes. I, mean, I think you know you you. I think it's it's wrong to think you could somehow explain uh, a Lee victory by sort of one point seven million votes as the product of Russian interference. But I do think we need to see as as the government does now are. Uh, the 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 uh, our electoral system itself and the probity and reputation of our uh, democratic system as itself being a form of critical national infrastructure. On your other your your other point about China, I think it is certainly true that uh, recent events, you know, the the crash of two thousand and eight nine, um, the struggle that the Western economies have had since then, uh, the way in which they're grappling to try to cope with global competition and digital technology mean that you know, the Chinese are able to uh, present uh, an attractive case, particularly when they're making their presentation to governments around the world, which are themselves attracted by an authoritarian model. And the Chinese are willing to say, we can give you all these goodies without any strings attached in terms of human rights or environmental standards or so on. Now, I think the, the lessons, there, there, there are sort of there are three, three lessons I, I take from this. One, um, it should be a wake up call for the West about the need for us to get our own uh, act in order and to ensure that we are demonstrably delivering the goods uh, in the way that our own electorates expect and which we can continue to point as a model uh, to other countries elsewhere that they should think about emulating. Secondly, um, just a word of caution here. I mean, we don't know um, how strong or how brittle the current government is in China. If you, you listen to sinologists uh, who follow these very carefully, they differ in their view. Some will say Xi is absolutely clearly in control. Others are saying no, he's having a, some pushback from uh, some of the old guard um, that, that uh, protégés of his two predecessors, uh, Hu Jintao and Zhang Jimin, uh, and that um, the, the impact of uh, the, the, the recessions in their main customers in the West and the impact of COVID mean that China is not actually delivering growth rates at the level that the public in China have come to expect and that the regime is therefore under more pressure than we sometimes realize. I just, it, I think it's almost impossible to uh, be certain whether that is or is not true. But I do notice these two things about China, which I think mean we shouldn't despair uh, in, in the democratic world. The first is that when the Chinese do give um, uh, help, they invest in countries, sometimes they, they find it, it, it hits them in the face a bit later. There was the case of um, Zambia, where there was large scale Chinese investment in the copper mining industry there, but where um, the black African workers felt that they were being patronized and their interests not being protected by Chinese managers who had been put in. And there, there were massive demonstrations and you know, Chinese managers chased out of the mining complexes inside 
Zambia. So sometimes you find some of these other countries see actually we're not too sure we want to have these links that could lead to China calling all the shots in our country. And the other thing I notice is that um, when you look at where refugees seek to travel to around the world, they don't seem for the most North Korea apart, they don't seem to be going into China. Um, that you know, they will be trying to get into the United States or into uh, European democracies or perhaps to Australia, uh, perhaps to South Africa if they're from some of their, their neighbors. Uh, and I think that is still a reminder that the model of a pluralist and liberal society, which we seek however imperfectly to embody, is still an enormously attractive one to the majority of people in the world. Thank you. So there is a Mark Crossley for a question that he has uh, uh, put in the chat. If Mark would like to address uh, directly the question to Sir David Lee, you can. And then there is a Professor Filaris Mietrepa. Please, Mark. Um, good evening, David. I just wondered if you were disappointed not to have the title as Deputy Prime Minister under Theresa May. Um, I, my, the, I came to the view, I mean, when she, I think that the, um, uh, all prime ministers tend to be very nervous about handing out that title. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I, I worked with very, very well with Theresa when she was Home Secretary, I, and I you know, got on fine with her since she was first elected to the Commons five years after I was. But I wouldn't say we were, you know, sort of bosom companions. Um, and the relationship of trust took a time to to build, to build up. I do think uh, that um, every prime minister should have a designated deputy on whom they unload the tasks that they do not wish to take as a personal priority. No prime minister can do everything. Every prime minister is under huge, relentless, permanent pressure. Look at the, always look at the photograph the day a prime minister takes office and the day a prime minister leaves office. And they have, they have aged at about twice the rate of normal human beings. And that's just the, the, the pressures that job entails. And when I look, there's the report out this week from Nick Herbert's um, Commission on Smart Government, there's some very good ideas in there. It seems to be one thing is missing uh, with this idea of a prime minister's department with greater power and scope is who is actually going to be doing the chasing up and implementing? Because politicians, particularly senior politicians who serve as cabinet ministers, are not going to be willing to take orders from civil servants or political advisors. Um, you know, they will want one of their own to do that and for that person to be very clearly acting with the uh, delegated authority of the PM. And I think that's the thing that if you don't have the title, it's more difficult. And I found after time, Whitehall got the message that Theresa was treating me as her number two, she was delegating things to me and I could speak confidently with her authority. Uh, but I think somebody who has the title of Deputy Prime Minister, it, it, that's a signal to the whole of Whitehall, to officials as well as to other ministers. This man or woman is there to exercise delegated authority on the Prime Minister's behalf. And, when, and, and therefore there's no point in trying to go over their heads and appeal to the PM of the day. So I, I think it would make just for a better quality of government in terms of a, uh, uh, the, the linking policy making and policy implementation uh, in the way it needs to be done it, to have a clear line of command in that way. Thank you again and thanks Mark for your question. Professor Phil Harris, please. Yes, th thank you, Maurizio. Uh, so David, um, excellent introduction and um, the, the breadth of your knowledge, I think is quite astounding. And, um, you know, um, from an observer, just observing government and, and people making it work. Um, I, I do think you're, you're one of the best I've certainly seen in, in the last decade. Um, I, I think the thing which um, is very agreeable to many of us is, if, if you like, just the fact that you've gone on with the detail 
and the decisions and move them forward and made them work rather than got um, caught in perhaps some of the hoobery, which, um, I, I, you know, to me does seem to be more distractions rather than getting on with the day-to-day -day work. Um, I, I think uh, turning to just part really of, of what you've covered, um, and, and I, I think working abroad and being international, and that's probably broadly my background, but I remember being in Belarus uh, in Minsk um, when the British embassy had its drains cut off because I think Lukashenko wanted them to vacate the building, which they shared with the Italian consulate, which was actually on Karl Marx Strasse, <laughs> um, because he wanted them to go to sort of, um, a, shall we say, um, a patriarch built complex, yeah. um, you know, a, and uh, it does get complicated. Um, the thing that's of interest to me, I think, is, is how we um, comprehend and manage, if you like, our relationships with China. I'm particularly interested in, is there a concerted effort by which, if you like, we track or monitor or put up an alternative to the Belt and Road Initiative? Because um, it's certainly been one of the keystones of Xi. Um, and I think uh, it certainly had its impact. Uh, just commenting really on, on um, international students in China. I, I've been fortunate in that I've visited probably maybe 40 Chinese universities in, in the last decade. Um, and of course, they've often offered bursaries really to vast numbers of mm. people from across, if you like, South America and Africa to be students and go through the process. And in the early days, it was only a trickle. But now, you know, there's serious numbers and, and of course, it's seriously integrated. Um, so I suppose the question I'm asking is, is there a consistent approach to the way we develop people in um, the third and second world um, emerging, if, if you like, from the West? Because it, it has been quite piecemeal, I think, and patchy. Um, Phil, first of all, thank you for your, your, your kind, uh, kind remarks. Yeah, and I, I, yeah, I, I just think it, everything in, almost everything in politics is a compromise. Um, and, and I said, because I started off on, you know, working as an advisor under the Thatcher government, that the thing about Mrs. T is that she had a very clear grasp of her strategic objectives. She knew what the sunlit upland looked like, as far as she could see. How you got there was a matter of tactics, and, and she was far less ideological in practice uh, than her sort of both her detractors and her admirers have tended to paint her in the years since. So she would duck and weave as the best of them. I also I think that's the right way to 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 to, to, to organize things. In Britain, we're we're not good enough at um, linking policy making to implementation and both to the allocation of money uh, within government. They tend to be dealt with in three separate silos. And actually, one of the good things about Nick Herbert's report is, is that he, he you know, argues strongly for the need to bring those three key functions of government together. Uh, I completely agree on, on that. I think that the, um, you know, and the other thing I think, I think has gone badly wrong in not just the UK government, but, but, but certainly in the UK in recent decades, has been a tendency to put um, concern about the media response ahead of working out what is the right policy. And I can remember a justice once uh, having a conversation with my senior officials. I can't remember what about now, but I, um, they were sort of objecting, oh, the Daily Mail won't like this and, and so on. And I said, well, look, uh, frankly, um, Let's decide, first of all, what the right policy is. Then when we've decided that, we think, how can we best sell and explain that to the media and the public? And I, you have to do it that way. And there was also this intake of breath. Oh, we're not used to thinking in that way. 
And I always remember Douglas Hurd saying to me once, um, you know, if the Daily Mail or the Sun, when he was Home Secretary, if the Daily Mail or the Sun hasn't called for my resignation at least once a month, I think I must be doing something wrong. Uh, <laughs> that was too bad a rule of thumb uh, for a, a sort of liberal conservative uh, Home Secretary. Um, the On your very important question about China, I think the answer is, is uh, the response is piecemeal. It's piecemeal both between democratic countries and within democratic countries. Um, I, I mean, there's, there's a very good stuff in the integrated review about this, about using soft power, the various aspects of soft power, uh, effectively to promote uh, national interests and to uh, augment our hard, hard power. Um, the, the, the US um, scholar, um, Joseph Nye, sort of writes about this and says, it's, it's, it calls it smart power, and you bring hard and soft power together. And there's something about the, the, the great campaign that was dreamt up actually on the back of the London 2012 Olympics, but has been a tremendous success, really has highlighted British culture as a tremendous asset. Um, I don't know if any of you have met Tom Fletcher, who's now pr uh, principal of Hartford College, Oxford. He was ambassador to Lebanon, and before that, he was Gordon Brown's sort of uh, diplomatic service to pri private secretary for, for foreign affairs. And Tom um, describes in his book, which is called The Naked Diplomat, um, how when he was ambassador to Lebanon, he, he had a British week, and they highlighted British pop music and art um, and uh, the visit, the vi visiting Britain um, uh, and, and scientific achievements. And he said it had a huge impact, much more than you would have achieved if you just tried to talk about um, uh, sort of on political channels only. And he was appearing on all sorts of Lebanese radio and TV programs with all types of different audiences that they would get at different times of the day. Um, and I think that is a clue to how we need to operate. I, it, I think it's one, it's one of the reasons why I found the, the, the government's decision on 0.7% uh, the uh, uh, aid uh, spending so disappointing, because I think the, the aid budget properly used uh, can be a tremendous soft power asset, as well as fulfilling important humanitarian objectives. And there are things like the British Council, things like the number of scholarships we give to Sandhurst, um, uh, Cranwell and Dartmouth, uh, to uh, the bright young officers from uh, foreign militaries, uh, the Chevening scholarships that the Foreign Office provides that allow a limited number of uh, people who are you know, perhaps rising stars of their ministries uh, around the world to come and uh, spend some time in the UK and have a structured course. It involves introduction to how we do things here. You know, we should be knitting all of those things together. We should be following up much better than we traditionally have done. It has got a lot better, but it was only when I was in the when I was in the forest. This, this is ten years ago. We were just starting to compile a database of achieving fellows, although we've been giving out these scholarships for years and years, but some of them we'd lost track of completely. So. I think there's a lot more that we need to do. Belt and Road Alternative, yes, I would love to see it. Um, uh, and I think that's certainly what Biden wants to see happen. Um, it will need a serious conversation between Washington, Brussels with an agreed EU27 position, and then with the UK and Japan and others um, involved as well. Um, and I hope it will happen. Uh, my worry is it's just going to it's it's going to take a very long time to jump through all the hoops uh, on that field. But I agree with you that that is that is the objective we should be aiming for, and the sooner the better. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Phil. Um, do you, do we have any other question from, uh, from so Ronel, please, <laughs> Ronel Lehman. Please. Hello, thank you, Maurizio, for hosting such an a, a engaging event. I always um, remind you, Sir David, that uh, the, the time I hosted a lunch with you, uh, where you were our guest of honour and speaker, 
uh, you got a message from, from number 10 and had to scurry off uh, because a, a senior cabinet minister resigned. <laughs> and I was left to, to continue uh, uh, in your wake, uh, which was um, a tough call considering <laughs> I wasn't in, in uh, any position to do so, but um, it, it was a very successful event like today is. Um, I wanted really to uh, ask you a security question about home, back home, because yeah. government's first line of duty is to protect its citizens and its country. And, you know, we've just had the Euros, the football match that, um, you know, we congratulate Italy on their, uh, uh, on their win. Um, but, you know, it was a showcase for the whole world. And mm. there was quite a lot of um, things that went wrong. Uh, we've seen again rumblings in the paper only today about uh, Dame Cressida Dick, whether she uh, should be renewed in, in the new year uh, as the Met Chief Police Commissioner. Um, I, I just wonder when we have such big occasions where the whole world is looking at us, um, are we deficient in some way in dealing with uh, you know, our own security? Because you know, we, we're, we're talking about the rest of the world, but if you haven't got your own house in order, um, it doesn't look good. I wasn't going to ask you, do you think she will um, be reappointed mm. um, next year? Because I think that's... Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, think, I think that the... My, but my judgment is that um, the police um, messed up on, on Sunday. I don't know what the reasons were why they did not have sufficient people, whether there was inadequate intelligence of what was going on or they were stretched because they, they were decided had decided to focus on some of the central London venues where they thought that there, there might be trouble and there was some some trouble earlier on. Um, and I, I know they need and they certainly need to to have a uh, a, a a look at that. Um, I and, and I think the and the problem is as you say that those images are transmitted all around the world. Um, there was a very interesting column that Hugo Rifkind um, wrote in the Times a couple of days ago, where he said, actually, if you look back at newspapers um, of reports of comparable international football matches in the 1990s or early, there was still there were disturbances of similar uh, uh, scale. But because there was no social media, they had less public impact. You know, you got what was the, the next, in the newspapers the next day, or perhaps the broadcast in the evening. And of course, you, what you got was what the, um, the, the, the in-house photographers or the paparazzi had taken and then sold to the newspapers. What you have now is everybody with a smartphone who can take a video or a still shot, upload those straight away. So there is an immediacy uh, and a drama that that is present now that just was not the case. Um, even if the objective reality has not altered compared with you know, 30, 40 years ago, nonetheless, an awareness of that different media environment ought to of itself inform how the police and the agencies prepare for these these events. I think what I would say is if I think back to the other, actually much bigger recent international showcase, which was the 2012 Olympics, um, that did go very smoothly from a security point of view, although I I have subsequently learned <laughs> through talking you know, when I was you know, in the loop and talking to agency chiefs that um, you know, there were some you know, difficult times in the preparation there when you're trying to sift out um, what is you know, might be evidence of a serious threat from a lot of chaff, um, and, and 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 how you make how you make the call at the end of the day about what you should should do. Only the, the, these are unenviable decisions to have to take. So I, I'm I'm not complacent um, about it, and I think the Met have some serious questions to answer about Sunday. But I think there's some good stuff as well. I just finish on this point, Ronald, that the Actually, I think, in terms of the general point, I think what's remarkable, and I'm not a great football fan, um, I actually think that the the way that Southgate and the team have behaved on and off the field has actually made the country 
feel better about itself than I think at any time since those 2012 Olympics. Um, I can't remember that public mood uh, being uh, as positive as it, as, it, as it has been in the last couple of weeks. I agree with you. It's been a, a great credit to the whole nation, yeah. actually, and also a United Kingdom in yes. some respects where we've got a big battle with Scotland coming. Mm. Big battle with part of Scotland, not, not only with the Scottish Nationalists, not with Scotland. <laughs> Good point. Good point, David. Thanks, Ronel. Thanks again. Uh, just uh, in, to give the time to our guests, to to our to any other members, to raise the question or raise the hands if you want. I have a, a question for you, sir, David. That is uh, that is a uh, is the usual question that we address to anyone that has participated in this uh, event. As we said, uh, San Marino is the oldest democracy in the world as a republic. Since 301, we, we are directly descendant from the Roman Empire with the, the, with the two consuls that we have a, two capital regent that they are in power of every six months. So the question that we have is what does mean democracy for Sir David Levin? Uh, I think it is, um, it is first, it is the rule of law. Um, because I think that um, the history of the 20th and early 21st centuries demonstrates that you can create democratic institutions, elected parliaments, elected presidents and the like, but unless you have independent courts run by you know, vigorously independent and fearless judges, uh, and unless you have governments and a political culture which accepts that everybody including the executive is subject to the rule of law uh, then you're not going to be able to sustain what we think of as a democratic society so i think it's the rule of law then democratic institutions uh, and there's no doubt in my mind that simply history practice strengthens those institutions over time uh, and the third pillar it seems to me is uh, a recognition of human rights grounded on a, a sense of the dignity and autonomy of each individual uh, and, and the, the, the need to have respect to them. That then provides you with an institutional and ideological framework uh, within which you can have a plural society which accepts difference of all kinds, a particularly difference, a profound difference of opinion, uh, but is able to find ways in which to uh, take decisions peacefully uh, and have the legitimacy of those decisions accepted by pretty much everybody in the society, including, crucially, by those who are in the dissenting minority. Thank you. And thanks again for the opportunity that you have been spent with us. We've been uh, together uh, close to an hour. So we are six minutes to the end. As always, we just want to, to give you the opportunity first to thank you, Sir David Levington, so everyone can also open their own microphone to applaud can, uh, Sir David Levington for the time that he spent with us. So really thank you for what you have done. Thank you for this. Uh, opportunity incredible um, opportunity that we had it i want also to remind to everyone that uh, issue life now the foundation issue life is uh, coming back in life we have the event that will be in december where we're going to have our christmas party on the in and out club where we're going to have uh, opportunity to stay together covid uh, rules uh, allowed it depends on what is going to happen at that time, but we are positive with double vaccination uh, to have it. So what we hope is that we are going to be live again in December. Everyone can participate, everyone can promote it, everyone can also um, buy the ticket uh, online on the Issue Life website. I want you also to remind that all the donation that uh, and all the money that Issue Life are raising, they are going to prevent uh, and to support and to combat poverty around the world, in particular to, uh, 
to sustain the education on the school of Kenya. And also that this year we have also made a very uh, consistent donation also to everywhere where Tratos and Isher Life are operation in uh, Nosley, in the Merseyside, to the Food and Bank of the United Kingdom, to the uh, several other um, foundation here in the UK, where we have support for the needs, unfortunately, due to these uh, COVID that also started to come in back also in the Great Britain. Again, David, thank you a lot for everything. Uh, the idea of a shared life is uh, to share the life in the digital era. Thank you for having given to us one hour of your time. Thank for all the participants as always for having given us one hour their own time. And thanks again for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Richard. I look forward to visiting San Marino. You are always <laughs> open and welcome <laughs> to visit the oldest <laughs> Republic in the world. Good evening to everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Keep safe. Bye. Bye.